This is a talk on translation technologies corresponding to many of your questions which saw these technologies as something to oppose or something that threatens the translation profession rather than something that can help it. My original title was Ist Translationstechnologie mein Freund? Is translation, is, are these technologies my friend? Uh, but my corrector said that didn't sound very appropriate, so it's become something like Are translation technologies helpful for me? Which is rather more anodyne. This question concerns It concerns in principle just the process part of my model of translation studies because transla translation technologies concern how you produce a translation, obviously. But I would argue that the technologies themselves are more powerful as drivers of communication history and that they affect also the nature of the products, of the text we produce and the text we work from, and very much the kind of people we are, the people we're involved, the skill sets we need, and the kinds of different range of professions that are available to us. So uh, I'll be addressing, in fact, all three parts of translation studies. So what technologies are we talking about here? Well, traditionally, really since the 1990s, we've had translation memories, TMs, um, of which the main brand names out there are listed. Uh, I've just got a few here, Trados, MemoQ, Omega T, etc. And I'm hoping you're aware of what they are and what they do. If not, uh, these are tools that store your previous translations. As you translate a new text, you finish that sentence or that, uh, that, that, that chunk, and those two, the ST and the TT, the start text and your translation of it, go into a memory. When you have that same sentence to translate again, or a similar sentence, your previous translation is brought up. And this can save you uh, time, basically. Uh, then we have machine translation, which is um, not saving your translations, but working from a database of previous translations, and that's MT. Uh, these were transfer-based and now they're statistics-based. I'll come to that in a minute. And I want to show you how both these come together in TMMT systems, that is, translation memories that incorporate machine translation. To find out about these technologies, you don't really have to come to me or come to class. Everything is available online, and you can download demos, and you can find out for yourself. And then there are discussion groups for all of the tools. So really, my message is go out there and discover it and explore it. Anyway, here is uh, Trados Studio. This is a translation memory suite. You can see what it's doing. Over here you have the text that you have to translate. It's divided up into, in this case, mainly sentences, but you can join the chunks together and you can split them if you want. And then it brings up, here they're translating the first, uh, the title, Getting Started. It's located an exact match from the database. This has been translated previously as S the Schritt, your first step. It's actually a very good translation. And it's marked in green as an exact context match. So all you have to do is say, yes, that is a valid translation. Uh, let's... See, this is from the Trados online tutorial, so there's no secrets there. Um, the thing is explained at great length and great detail, that's too much. And uh, we can then see what the translator does with the next segment if they get to it. Uh, basically, the interface has up here space for the previous translation, so you can select from the ones that are there. And over here, you get further information from your uh, database, your, your terminology base, if you like. I'm going to go forward because he's so slow explaining everything. There we go. Okay, so we've got the next uh, sentence he's translating, finding a location for your photo printer. 
Uh, this is almost exactly what you want. It's got all the words you want there, except you don't want that first word, do you? So that's actually a 91% match. Up here, you've got the other fuzzy matches. Fuzzy matches means just not exact match. The first one is green. That's an exact match. This one is 91%. You can have fuzzy matches down to 80, 70%. Okay. And here you've got a 91%, and this is in the 80s. I can't actually read it there. Anyway, uh, so the first one's the one you want. You, you affirm that. And then to translate that, you really just remove the first word, and you've got your translation. Okay? It's a fairly minor change that's needed. What are you doing here? You're actually repairing your previous translation. Uh, that's good at a 90% fuzzy match. That's an easy and logical thing to do. When you get down to 70% or so, you'll find proposals here where you might have three or four things to change. And that becomes cognitively quite difficult. No matter, you can just wipe it clean and do a, a translation from scratch. That is, translate as you normally would. What are the advantages here? Firstly, the a, a, a silly advantage, but a very clear one, is that you don't skip sentences. Everything is divided up here, and everything is here. So you don't overlook sentences, as you might if you're going from one place to another in traditional paper-based or screen-based translation. Uh, secondly, you're saving time by bringing up your previous translations. And thirdly, you're getting more consistent terminology. You can make it and phraseology. You can make sure that you're using the same word for the same thing throughout the entire translation. These are real advantages, and I tell all my students that they should be using a translation memory of some kind. I don't matter. I, I don't care which kind, but which one they actually use. All of them have these days virtually the same interface and the same techniques. Uh, so, for example, uh, we would start with MemoQ, which is quite accessible, and they get uh, the basic skills of working with that. And they can transfer those skills and the memories into Trados or any other tool that your client might require. Machine translation is different from translation memories in that the database is compiled from either translations generated by linguistic algorithms through an analysis of the start text and the generation of the target text, or a basis of previous translations. Uh, in the early days of machine translations, you had a transfer-based architecture, which was based on the linguistic algorithms. And that worked well enough between cognate languages, for example, between Romance languages, you get quite good quality output, uh, which then has to be repaired, or post-edited, as we say. However, the real advance in machine translation has been, uh, really, in, in, in the new centuries, since 2000, uh, when statistical-based machine translation has been used. This involves the probability of, let's say, three words appearing together in the start text, the probability of them uh, having been translated as a three words in the target text. And you get the probability for those three words, then the three words after, and the th three words prior to it. And you get quite good matches purely on statistical probabilities. The, the uh, mathematics is far more complicated than anything I can explain or understand, uh, but the results and the difference in the results um, is intriguing and is, is proving to be far more successful. The best way to, to check uh, uh, machine translation, I'm sure you all use something like uh, Google Translate or Microsoft Translate. Uh, these are systems that are using uh, statistical machine translation. And they give results that can give you the gist or give you an idea of what's going on. What you're looking at here, though, is Google Translator Toolkit, which is uh, a, a good thing to have fun with and to use in the training situation because it, it actually brings together machine translation 
with uh, translation memory options. Here you can see the source text, uh, start text has been divided up into sections as you translate, it's going to happen. Here we're translating the title, Great Pyramid of Giza. And over here, this is into Chinese, we brought up a suggestion from the machine translation database, which the translator then works on, repairs or post edits up in this space before moving on to the next text, the next fragment, and so on throughout the text. This is again from Google's online tutorial. And here you've got them working on the next segment and bringing up the toolkit where you actually have previous translations of this. So here it's working like a translation memory and up there it's working like machine translation. So you can either work from scratch, do your own translation from the start text. You can post edit, that is repair the machine translation suggestion, or you can select any of the previous translations from the various translation memories and work on them. So this tool is offering you at least those three options uh, to translate. This is good fun. It also has um, tools that enable you to share your translation with other people, to uh, co-translate or do collaborative translation. A group of people can be working on the same document at the same time. Uh, what it can't do, and this is the reason why you should not use this tool professionally, what it can't do is keep the translation a secret. Well, I don't know, Google might promise you that there is an option for the text not to be made publicly available to anyone, uh, but would you trust Google? That's up to you. Uh, we've tried some experiments with this. We say only keep the translation in my personal translation memory, and we discovered, lo and behold, that the translation had been fed into the general database. It may be different this week, I don't know. However, for reasons of confidentiality, and most of your clients would like their text to be kept confidential and not made public, uh, you would want to use a different tool uh, rather than this one. This one is great for uh, localizing websites or working on translating Wikipedia, uh, anything where secrecy, confidentiality is not at stake. Uh, for your big high paying clients, no, don't do this. Go to one of the translation memories, uh, which these days um, have often uh, an empty feed. When the translation memory doesn't give you a, a good match, it draws a blank, it can draw on a database of some kind and give you a machine translation proposal to work on. So much the same thing as you see happening here can happen in the more recent uh, translation memory suites. I just want to give you an example of the way statistical machine translation is working and why it's going to give us some interesting solutions. Here's one of my favorite problems. What did Don Quixote and Don Quixote have to eat on Saturdays? And in the text it says, duelos y cabrantos. And online you can actually find a recipe for duelos y cabrantos and a picture, yum yum, eggs and, and chorizo, spicy, spicy pork. Hmm. Okay, it turns out though that this dish was invented perhaps in the 19th century in response to the text uh, written in the early 16th century. And so Don Quixote certainly did not eat that on Saturdays. Let's see what Google Translate does with this. Okay, duelos, here you have duelos, means duels, two people fighting. Okay, not a thing you would eat. And down here at the bottom, I mean, it's not stupid, it gives you a dictionary. It has bereavement, grieving, mourning, when somebody's died. Again, not something you'd want to eat. It's failing. And this is when we all declare, ah, machine translation can't work, it'll never get anything acceptable. 
Even then I put in duelos y quebrantos. Quebrantos is translated here as losses, duels and losses. Would you want to read that? Probably not. But wait before we declare it to be an entire failure. You write in just the next word, los, los sabados, okay, or Saturdays. And what happens? Duelos y quebrantos los sabados, scraps on Saturdays. How did it do that? How did you get from duels and breakings or losses to scraps? What linguistic algorithm could make that transition? There is no linguistic algorithm. What happened was it got those four words together, found in the database somewhere that those four words, duelos y quebrantos, los, uh, appeared together with a high match with this one, which is from a previous translation of the Quixote by a previous translator. What this means is that the machine is not composing the translation. The machine translation these days is not translating as such, decomposing, recomposing a sentence. It is locating a previous human translator. All the translations are by, well, we hope, are by humans, or in theory are by humans, uh, and the machine is just a tool for locating the most appropriate human translation or the one we might then want to work on. The problem is not banal. You can see here from a series of uh, translations of the Quixote that no one really knows what he had to eat on Saturdays. Everyone was guessing, and Scraps is as good a guessing as anything else you might like to come up with. Now, statistical machine translation seemed to promise a revolution. It seemed to be game, set, and match for the duel, if you like, duelo, uh, between translators and machines, for the following logic. If you see what we were doing in Google Translator Toolkit, where we repair a machine translation suggestion, our repairs, our post-editing, our corrections are then fed into the database, and so the database improves. And the better the database gets, the more people use it, the more people use it, the better it gets, and you get this virtuous circle oh, which reaches up to the higher levels of the Tower of Babel. We will have perfect machine translation simply because everybody is using this tool for free. Uh, Google has this great knack of making a lot of money out of giving away things for free. Okay, what they did with their search engine uh, seems to be promised in their machine translation tool as well. Uh, this brings up uh, millennial type interest in the idea of singularity. Singularity is this California idea for the moment when the capacity, the processing capacity of computers will be the same as that of the human brain and will surpass it. This moment of singularity when the computer thinks as well as we do and then will do much better. Uh, and there's lots of uh, concern about how this will alter the entire relationship between humans and, and machines, etc. In the case of translation technologies, though, singularity seems to be some way off, as indeed does the idea of the virtuous circle going up to heaven. The reason for this is that people are stupid. How are people stupid? Well, they pick up a machine translation produced by Google Translate or any other tool you can find on the web. They think it is a good translation, probably because they don't know the language is concerned and they have to trust it. Then they put that into a text in electronic form or somewhere on the web. The Google crawler comes across that, feeds that rubbish into the database, and instead of people using it to make the database better, people use it and the database gets worse and worse and worse, and the fewer people use it because it gets worse, 
And instead of the virtuous circle, you have a vicious circle bringing us down to hell or sending the whole thing down the toilet. Which of these two circles is prevailing? I suspect at the moment, as does Google, that the second is bringing down all the promises. How do you so save, how do you resolve that problem? Uh, well, one is you can educate people in what machine translation can and can't do. It's there as a source of suggestions to be post-edited, to be repaired. Uh, and two, you can stop making the Google Translate suggestions available in other tools, which is what Google has indeed done. I talked about the machine translation feeds going into translation memories. Uh, Google has now made that a pay service instead of a free service. Uh, so people won't use the tool stupidly. Stay tuned. I don't know where that story is going to head. I suspect that sooner or later we will restore things towards the logic of the virtuous circle. That is, we will have to pay serious attention to uh, statistical machine translation and work with it. In my classes in Monterey every year I do a test. I never tell my students what they have to do with translation technologies. I just say find out for yourself and that's my message to you. Go and discover what it can do. One of the reasons is it changes so fast. Uh, new tools come up, new technologies and uh, I'm not up to speed with them. However, this is a simple test. You get a 200-word text. You get my students. You see this is a mixed language group here in these two years. Uh, they do it with machine translation, and some do it without machine translation. Then you compare the two, and you find that in both years, machine translation gives you a slightly faster text. Well, there, so there's a uh, slightly faster translation, sorry. So there is a productivity gain of some kind. And then we get the students to revise each other's translations. And I do this in a situation where they don't know if they're revising machine translation text or a fully human text. And I can show them that there's no significant drop in quality. That is, they make approximately the same number of corrections when they're revising uh, through machine translation. Machine translation does not bring the quality of the text down at least not in a systematic, uh, across-the-board way. So the message here is, look, try it, you've got nothing to lose. Uh, Ignacio Garcia in Sydney in Australia did a similar thing, a much better sort of experiment with Chinese English, and found something similar, uh, that whatever you do, it's not going to be worse. There may be something to gain and nothing really to lose. So the message is there again. Try it and see. We are at the moment then with respect to these particular technologies, particularly statistical machine translation, we're at a, a, a tipping point where you can't say that the, the gains will be huge. Um, it used to be Trados and the market leaders in translation memory. They used to sell their product as a productivity tool you will gain time. And you find that the, the time gain is not as great as, as advertised. And then they started to sell it as, as a translation control tool, a terminology control tool, which is true enough. Uh, these technologies enable big projects to be harmonized and revised and terminology to be made consistent. And that is a significant advantage. The various experiments on which translation tools work better uh, are, are, are rather spurious in some way, basically because in most cases you're testing the quality of the database and, and not the, the usefulness of the tool itself. Um, if machine translation is giving you bad results for a particular field or set of texts, uh, feed in some good translations into the database and the quality gets higher. So it's not the tool, it's the database that you're testing. The way forward, I think, with statistical machine translation seems to be uh, to find ways to stop idiots from polluting the databases. That is, keep the databases clean. And 
the way to do this is to develop your own in-house machine translation system. For example, um, you can do this for each product that you have in a company. So the, the terminology and the phraseology for that product is kept very consistent. And there is a, an MT tool for that product. Translators have to use it. Uh, and they correct it and clean it as they go along. And this, in fact, means that within the company, uh, machine translation is becoming like a big collective translation memory. Here, are our, here, here is our translation memory, our storehouse of previous translations for all text related to this particular product. Uh, this is the way forward chosen by IBM, for example. And it seems to be giving very good results with significantly less post-editing being needed. That is, real productivity gains. So that's the way forward. It's not, the, the solution will not be in, in automatic crowdsourcing, in letting everybody participate in it, uh, and thereby the logic of the masses will improve the quality of translation. That seems not to be the solution. Post-editing is a term we use for correcting machine translation output. It's called post-editing because if you want machine translation to work well, there are two things you can do. You can pre-edit the text, that is, write the text in, in simple language, which the machine cannot misconstrue, or post-edit, repair the text when the mistakes have been put in by the machine. Uh, we don't do much training in Europe. We don't do enough training in technical writing, which uh, should lead into pre-editing, how to write good, clean, clear technical texts for machine translation. And that's a field that should be developed in our, in our training programs, I think. Uh, most of our attention these days is focused on post-editing, uh, repairing the mistakes once they're there. Post-editing is a bit like revising any old translation, but it has some differences. One is that machine translated text will give you quite good specific terminology and phraseology, probably better than a human translation done by a non-expert in the field. But uh, when it's wrong, it's really wrong. I mean, it's easy to spot the mistakes in machine translation. You'll have terminology from a completely different field, or you'll have um, uh, noun plural, uh, noun verb um, mismatch, or you'll have the verb in the wrong, entirely the wrong position in the sentence. Uh, in a sense, this is helpful. I mean, if you're going to make a mistake, make a big obvious one because the cognitive effort to correct it is less than uh, when you've got three small mistakes. You see, the logic of fuzzy matches in, uh, in uh, translation memory systems, when you get 70 to 80% fuzzy matches, is here's a translation. There are a couple of mistakes in it. You have to find those mistakes and modify them. And that can often take more cognitive effort than simply recognizing a big obvious mistake or getting rid of the sentence entirely, the machine translation proposal, and translating from scratch in a fully human way. So this logic is operating in a slightly different way. Uh, I've put unique features there. I'm not too sure. I don't have uh, a great deal of uh, data on that. But we have found that the translation memory databases, when people use translation memories, they will tend not to use uh, as many of the, some of the uh, linguistic elements and structures that are in the target language and not in the start language, uh, as predicted by the theory of, of, of tendencies that I've mentioned previously. Uh, but that, okay, could also be a fact of a uh, lack of revision, uh, a lack of time spent revising. People, when they're doing post-editing, tend to l focus their revision on each segment as they go along, and it's harder to see the text as a whole.
Also, if you remember, I uh, gave you this list of, of translation solutions, these ones here, and then can be broken down into all these ones. When we go back and look at the kind of text resulting from uh, MT post editing, we tend to find that there are fewer solutions lower down in the list. MT will not tailor the text. I mean, it's programmed to, so you've got something there for every sentence in the in the start text, so it will not do any of that. Uh, it will do very little, or you get lucky sometimes on the idioms, but it can't apply a logic of compensation, for example. Uh, and it's not very good at changing the density, simplifying a text or making it more dense, as the case may be. Similarly, it will not um, use any of the copying strategies uh, as an expressive resource. It will copy the start text as a default. When it draws a blank and there's nothing else to propose, it'll say what was in the start text. But we've seen that translators can consciously use copying procedures as a stylistic device. So what happens with machine translation, post-editing machine translation? Our solutions tend to stay in this middle range around here and do not do the kind of flashy uh, uh, procedures that, that humans might take a risk doing up the top and down the bottom. That is, machines teach us to play it safe. Once again, risk aversion comes to the fore and risk taking takes a back seat. What do we do with these technologies as translators, as people being trained to be human translators? Well, you can oppose them, as has been done. This is from the uh, uh, Quebec uh, Translator Association, and they're warning people not to believe that machine translation is a true translation. They use a true translation, okay. I know what they mean, and I think that's a good message. We have to get that out to the whole world. Do not believe that machine translation is an adequate translation for all purposes. It's there to give you the gist of what's going on. But look at the way the logic then, I mean, this is a very good social warning, I agree very much, but then they go down and you call on a certified translator for all your translation needs. The conclusion is here, don't trust any of the technologies at all. Come to us, good old, the, the, the human translator you've always known, and trusted and respected. Ultimately, this becomes an argument against the technologies. I'm not so convinced that that's a good argument for us here today. These are some of the questions that you ask. There are also questions you know, about the fear of technology, which you seem to have collectively. But others were asking questions, how do I make my place in the market? How do I uh, establish myself in the wide sea of translators? I like that. How do I differentiate myself? Now, one of the answers to that question has to be by doing things you can do as a new generation and that the older generation doesn't want to do, doesn't know how to do. And the use of translation technologies is probably one of those things. It's a kind of rule. The younger you are, the better you are at technologies, at, at computer stuff. My 10-year-old son, if I have a problem with my, my cell phone, mobile phone, handy, whatever you want to call that, I give it to him and he fixes up in two seconds. And I say, how did you do that? He has, he has to reply, I'm younger than you. Okay, you're younger than the people who are opposing the technologies and saying, bring it back to your good old human translator who will not make a mistake. You are the people who can make your way in new niches of the industry, especially in the localization sector where these technologies are the norm, and become professionals who are highly competent in areas that the older professionals are not. So I'm suggesting that for you, translation technologies can and should be your friend, and you should get out there and find what they can do for you. Find out, discover it. Don't take my word for it. But, you reply, and some reply, these technologies are also threatening us as professionals because they enable anyone 
to translate. And it's true. The tool there in Google Translator Toolkit says, yes, translate this with your friends, Tr share your translations with your friends. Anybody can participate in it. And it's very clear, I think, from that example that uh, you may have a very weak knowledge of the start language, uh, a very good knowledge of the target language, and often you can produce a workable text with, without much knowledge of the start language because the machine knows that basic linguistic competence. I do that with my class. We translate a text from Russian and nobody knows Russian and the, the output is usable. How do they do that? They just use what the machines are suggesting and they repair it and, 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 and use some common sense, basically. So this seems to be a threat from whatever you want to call it. There are many names. Mass voluntary translation, I think. Crowdsourcing, collaborative translation, etc. Let's look at the way some of that's working with the technologies. The most famous example of crowdsourcing is, that means you know, work going out to people who do it for free, is, uh, is, is Facebook, which all of you know and use, I suspect. And this is an example of, of the uh, crowdsourcing translation of Facebook into Spanish. Uh, they have to translate the, the phrase, can't find who you're looking for. And then you have some proposals made by translators. And then the community votes for the translation they like best. Uh, I rather like that. You know, democracy is good for your governments. Why not for translation as well? Uh, sometimes people vote for something that's linguistically incorrect, but hey, it's a social community. These are the people who know and feel what works best for them in that community. Uh, perhaps they know things that uh, linguistic rules don't. In most cases, though, uh, particularly in electronic texts, the shortest translation is generally the best. That's the way it works. And it's not taking money particularly away from professional translators. Uh, we're doing Facebook uh, crowdsourcing translation into Catalan, for example. Facebook is not going to localize into Catalan for any commercial uh, reason. Uh, the users themselves will do this because they want to have that product in their language and the benefits are for them. A very good, well-known example of uh, the way free uh, machine translation is being used, free, almost free, is called Reuters Market Light. You can look that up on, on Wikipedia. And you'll find the way this has helped farmers in India get information on their, on their mobile phones. People don't have computers. Everybody has a mobile phone. And it basically means that information on crops, on, on, on futures market, uh, going prices for crops, and uh, mid to long term weather forecasts are automatically translated into their local languages. And they pay a very small fee for this service. Um, the, the information is in noun phrases and numbers, so it, it's fairly easy uh, to process through machine translation. And it has meant that the farmers, instead of being the victims of the merchants in the cities who had that information and could control the prices, the farmers now have that information themselves and are significantly empowered by uh, machine translation. It's a, an intriguing example and something that we might like to see extended to other fields as well. Uh, in the face of Facebook, it's a cultural, social benefit to a certain language community that results. Uh, Reuters Market Light suggests that this logic can be applied in the commercial sphere as well. You do find that there are free online services for what's called participatory, pa participatory culture, the Participatory Culture Foundation, okay? Uh, which goes through various ideologies such as opposing global capitalism, empowerment to the masses, empowerment of minor cultures, minor languages. Uh, those are all good things and possible things. Uh, what we also see, though, is that some of the companies that are set up to do this apply the logic of offering something for free, 
but also um, having a commercial operation in the background. Uh, one of them is Amara, another dot sub. I have to get rid of things like that. Go. Uh, dot sub is a free online tool. It's been used to translate the, the TED talks with the subtitles, uh, and that's good fun. But dot sub is also a company that provides professional subtitling uh, to clients. So they can take people over from the voluntary field. You know, you've learned how to use the tool. You're good at this. Here, over now, you can do a commercial project as well. Uh, so the the ideologies of the voluntary technologies, uh, crowdsourcing, collaborative, participatory culture, also tends to mesh in with the uh, the commercial sphere. There are numerous online uh, fan sub communities these days. This is one. Quite a lot of people are involved in this. Uh, they're producing subtitles for uh, films and TV series. They do it for free. It's done as a social activity. Uh, is it challenging global capitalism? Well, yes and no. Uh, what it does is, is channel Hollywood, American culture all over the world, which seems to upset uh, no particular capitalism ideologically. And then there are interesting ideas like Duolingo. Uh, I use this with my son to learn German at the moment. Uh, you have free online courses. They're good fun. Go and try them to learn a language online by yourself there. And part of it involves learners correcting translations at the more advanced levels. And the translations they get to correct are translations uh, from websites, so as people, the idea is this, as people learn the languages at advanced levels, they're actually translating the web for free. It's a win-win situation, uh, a nice idea. Uh, something similar uh, uh, is claimed for the captures that we use, you know, when you have to write the numbers or write the words that you see in the image, that you are proving, improving the optical recognition uh, of text on the web. I don't know to what extent these are actually viable as solutions. However, uh, it's a whole field out there to explore. How can these technologies help us solve real problems using voluntary work, but also using professional work? One of the models that has intrigued me here is by the Center for Global Intelligent Content. I suspect they've now changed their name again. Uh, these are people in Ireland, and this is a workflow model of the way the technologies allow crowd translation, that is volunteer translation, to interact with the work of professionals. So, a text comes in, it's broken up for the translation memory database. And that then goes through machine translation, and it's crowd translated. That is, it goes out to area experts, people who know about it, but perhaps don't know about the languages so much, or at least the, the start language. Think of um, a website or a, a document for Greenpeace, where the people in Greenpeace are volunteers and they know a lot about ecology, environment, and the, the history of, uh, of the politics of whatever issue they're dealing with. They'll know a lot and can correct that first machine translation. So there's a first post-editing done there through crowd translation. But then that is revised by a professional translator over here. The professional comes in to clean up the text, perhaps to make it clearer, more understandable, or stylistically coherent, as you happen to, as happens down here, with another level of professional intervention. Uh, so the, the professionals intervene here revising the translation, and then a stylistic revision. And there are more professionals here who have to put the document back together. Uh, often the images and, and things are stripped out here, have to be put in here, or it has to be re-engineered for the website. And then you have your localized content at the end. This is intriguing, first because it suggests that professionals can work productively with area experts with voluntary people or people who may indeed be paid, that it can be collaborative effort made possible by these technologies. And secondly, it suggests that the kinds of work that are 
that are called upon are not in uh, knowing the two languages very well and doing it all yourself. Firstly, there are jobs in project management for anything as complex as that. You need someone who can control it and coordinate it. Secondly, you need professionals who are good here at post-editing and recognizing the problems involved there. You need stylistic editors, people who write the target language very, very well, and they're experts in that. And you need the engineers who can uh, set up the technologies for the process and do the desktop publishing or put the whole thing back together and make it look nice at the end. So there's a new range of skill sets that are being called upon. And if we're training you just to do uh, good old-fashioned language-to-language -language translation, you can probably use and apply those skills in any of those areas, including project management. It's good to have someone who knows about languages and about the problems. But you will require additional skills as well, the skills that come from using the technologies. So, I would like to question some of the myths that are circulating about translation technologies. Uh, a lot of you said in your questions, they weren't questions, they were cries for help, I think. They say, the machine cannot translate like a human. Of course it can't, but it doesn't have to. The machines we have now locate human translations. All the translations that come through the statistical system are human. It's just a matter of having the wrong human in the wrong time and place. Progress with machine translation is inevitable. Wrong. The logic of the vicious circle could predominate. And uh, progress will come, I think, from greater control of the databases. Machine translation takes work away from professionals. I have no real evidence of that. I suspect that what happens is that in the past 30 years, let's say, uh, translation technologies have risen, uh, productivity of translators has risen, but so has the number of translations done. What, by whatever index or, or, or counting mechanism you, you, you care to use, uh, globalization has just increased the, the amount of communication that goes between languages. Uh, so the pie has got bigger. Some of that pie is done by machine translation. Some, a lot, is done by uh, lingua franca, people using English to talk between themselves without a translation, a translator. That's fine as well. Uh, that happens increasingly. English has risen as a lingua franca and Translations have risen, the number of translations. So these are not contradictory logics. They are simply complementary ways of dividing up the growing pie of international communication. Uh, the taking work away from professionals might apply uh, in the field of subtitling of uh, films and, and, and uh, and, and, and series, although a lot depends on the level of quality of subtitling required by certain television stations or cinema distributors, for example. Okay, But that's just one field uh, or subfield within the entire range of translation interpreting activities. Professionals do not like post-editing. Yes, we do get that uh, at the beginning. A lot of people say, oh yes, I'm trained to translate, I do not post-edit. And I've had students who say, I came here to learn to translate, I will not be a post-editor. Um, but every technology, every new technology, has always been resisted, resisted by the people who came to power with the old technology. So we would have to ask, which professionals are these, how old are they, and who has been telling them things? Machine translation will eventually replace human translation. Uh, it, it may, it just depends which way it goes. Okay? Uh, it will probably do that for many of the boring, repetitive texts that do not require the, the high-risk uh, kinds of solutions that do ultimately uh, call upon the responsibility of a human translator. Okay? Uh, so, I don't think that's going to happen. It may happen. It may happen that, that the language professionals will move on to even more exciting jobs, such as company representation or 
producing new texts in new languages. Human translating will always be what it always was. On one level, yes. On one level, that basic skill set will still be there. Will it be in the same demand in our societies? No. And will translators be able to require uh, that they have a job where they're only translating in the previous traditional way? No. Not any more than, than uh, uh, literature uh, will always be written with a pen and paper. Uh, people didn't want to move to computers. Journalists didn't want to move to computers. Now everybody's moved to computers. That initial resistance uh, is overcome, and it does alter the way people write literature, the way people write journalistic articles, and indeed the way people translate. Perhaps it will be that the fully human, high-quality translation will become a luxury good. People will pay for it and will pay a lot of money for it, and only some very highly qualified professionals will be able to do it. Uh, it may not be economically justifiable. In many situations, a cheaper translation is just as good. It may not be necessary. Uh, a degree of imperfection has to be allowed. People recognize mistakes and overlook them. There is this forgetting of translation imperfections that is necessary for the simple functioning of communication. I suspect, though, that that high-quality, fully human translation will still have a place. Why? Um, it happened, I think, two weeks ago when the United States and Europe and Iran agreed to sort of agree on a deal concerning Iran's nuclear capacity. And two statements were read out, one in English and then the second by the Iranian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Persian, in Farsi. And he said at the beginning, to, apologizing to the journalist, you know, you don't have to pay any attention to this. It's a text in Farsi. It's exactly the same as what you just heard in English, so I'm sorry about this, but I have to read this in Farsi. Now, I know, and you know, it's not exactly the same, because translations are not exactly the same. And there's probably some little cunning tricks going on there in, in, in the in the differences between the languages. But why, therefore, did we have to have that Farsi text? He uh, said this in perfect English. Obviously, the negotiations had been carried out in English, and yet the translation was necessary. Why? I think the first, uh, uh, probably the most important reason is that the existence of that translation and the presumption of equal value, old-fashioned equivalents, accords respect to both parties in that negotiation. It gives respect to the language and culture of one of the parties there. Most people in the world who are unhappy with those in power, unhappy with the West especially, the people who want to create new forms of life and government, systematically say, we are not respected. People do not respect me. People do not respect my language, my culture, my history, my traditions. This kind of translation is still needed in order to accord real respect to cultural difference. If not, if we move translation into the imperfections and efficiencies of machine translation, we will lose respect. We will gain productivity gain in amount of communication, but lose a lot of that intercultural respect that is really so necessary.